Hello everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hotla Mode and today on Hotla Mode I am going to tell you the story of how Andre Lee Ontali single-handedly saved John Galliano's career. Now to be fair, I've been hesitant to discuss a John Galliano design collection for quite some time and for those that know the story of his anti-Semitic outburst back in 2011, it's understandable why. But when Andre Lee Ontali, the iconic Vogue editor, tastemaker, and champion of young designers passed away in January of 2022, I thought it was important to discuss not just Tally's outfits or his quotes, because that felt somewhat surface level to me. And that's because Tally was also a mover and shaker within the fashion industry whose connections and gravitas allowed for him to help make designers, one of whom was John Galliano. And was it not for Andre Leon Tally? Well, John Galliano may have never reached the fashion stardom we all know of. So we're going to be discussing John Galliano's Fall 1994 collection, a show that without the help of Tally and so many factors, would have undoubtedly left Galliano with very little in terms of social status and financial stability. What would go on to be called the Slumberger collection is one that cemented Galliano as a true talent in the fashion world and helped him achieve his goal of attaining control of an haute couture house like Dior. And it would have never been possible without Andre's expertise in terms of knowing everyone who was anyone, which was only one of the legend's many talents. Let's break down this John Galliano Fall 1994 collection. But first, in order to tell the story of Andre and John, we should start with Andre, the only child of Alma and William Talley, a young black couple from the southern United States. Andre described being left in the care of his grandmother Benny, which was normal for black families at the time that he was born, and so he grew up with her in Durham, North Carolina, which is close to Duke University. His first love in terms of fashion came from his grandmother and great-grandmother's church-going attire, and with a dedication to Vogue magazine, he devoured information about fashion and its designers. He went to Brown University, where he studied French, but through friends at school and his impeccable taste, he got a referral to work under Diana Reland when she was the special consultant to the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Costume Institute. Little did I know when I got to New York, I would end up meeting Diana Vreeland. Vreeland was impressed by him and his understanding of clothing and took him under his wing referring him to fashion publications later on. He then started working with Andy Warhol at Interview Magazine, and then moved to Women's Wear Daily under John Fairchild, and then to Ebony Magazine with Mrs. Eunice Johnson, then to American Vogue, then to Vanity Fair, then to House and Garden, and then back to American Vogue. It just happened for me. And I'll tell you why it happened for me. Knowledge is power. Now, throughout this time, he graced the fashion and social elite, and they called upon him for his opinion and company quite often. Karl Lagerfeld, Yves Saint Laurent, Anna Wintour, Paloma Picasso, Oscar de la Renta, Lee Radswill, Manolo Blahnik, Diane von Furstenberg, and Bianca Jagger are just a few that over the years depended on his opinion. Andre was leaned on heavily by Anna Wintour during her time at Vogue and House and Garden as well, and she has always said that she didn't know her fashion history well, and having a walking encyclopedia like Tally around gave her an edge. Tally was also impressive in his ability to find fashionable diamonds in the rough, one being a then young John Galliano, who Tally met initially on a night out in London. Now, in Dana Thomas's Gods and Kings, Tally described Galliano's look on their first meeting as a quote, little Lord Fauntleroy. The meeting was of no real significance, though, as the two would only be reunited due to a shoot for the October 1992 issue of American Vogue, and Galliano wasn't even in attendance. Tally was on location shooting at Glyn Kuarth, a Welsh manor, and to the entire country of Wales and the Welsh language. I apologize, that was awful, I know it, I'm sorry. But this manner belonged to the Harlick family for generations. Now, Amanda Harlick, previously Grieve, had been a Harper's and Queen junior fashion editor from an upper crust British family who met Galliano in either 1984 or 1985 through a shoot she needed clothing for. She eventually became the first stylist Galliano ever had and provided inspiration for many of his early collections. She had married the Baron Harlick after meeting him at Oxford, and the manor became of interest to Tally not only because of the aristocratic affiliation, but also because Harlick was a woman of good and fashionable taste. Tally, alongside his then assistant, Isabella Blow, went to Wales and was fascinated by Harlick's clothing. And one piece that stood out was, quote, a jacket that was structured, but in black organza and see-through. In it was silver sparkles that moved, like when a child has a toy, and turns it upside down, and the glitter floats. Now, this might have been a coat from Galliano's Spring 1992 collection, and while I haven't found imagery of a black organza jacket, 
I have found a white organza one that sparkles in a somewhat similar manner to Tally's description. Now, after this meeting with Harlech, Tally recounted that Emmanuel Alt, former editor-in-chief of French Vogue, said he had to see a Galliano collection for himself. And with Galliano showing in Paris, it was made easier. I can't be sure which was Tally's first show of Galliano's, although he does mention one that was prior to the removal of funds by the company Plein Sud, which was ran by Fasala Moore, which would be the spring 1993 John Galliano collection, as Galliano had no money for a fall 1993 show. Now, Tally would have been smitten with a combination of inspirations on Galliano's part, as he likened it to the way that Diana Vreeland spoke, in rhymes or references to different periods and people. Galliano could easily slither from 18th century stripes popularized through the Robo Anglaise to Madeleine Viennet's invention of the bias cut technique in the 1930s, with empire waistlines made mainstream by the Empress Josephine when her husband Napoleon Bonaparte led France. So there's a lot, you know, it's just, there's a lot of shit. There. Galliano's reconstructionary viewpoint would tap into so many elements of French fashion history and culture, which Tally was known to be fond of. So his willingness to help the struggling designer made quite a lot of sense. Now, after attending Milan Fashion Week with Anna Winter, Tally went to meet Galliano late one evening as he prepared for his spring 1994 collection. Tally knew that Galliano missed the fall 1993 season by not showing a collection, which was seen poorly within the fashion establishment, and still is. And another season missed would have been detrimental to his career and his brand. When Tally appeared at the, quote, studio, aka a ramshackle apartment, there was a ball gown on a mannequin with big hoop skirt structured by plastic tubing, which got Tally's heart beating even faster. The collection would be spring 1994, and Harlick had dreamed up a storyline which Galliano followed. The models would be based on Russian czarinas or princesses, fleeing from Russia after the overthrowing of the royal family by the Bolsheviks. They would leave to Scotland and try to make their way to the royal ascot in a collection divided into three sections by appearance. Tally was instantly drawn to the drama, and again the mixing of multicultural expression, so he decided to help however he could. It's said that he would bring bags of McDonald's to the studio every night, and called on Anna Wintour to help bring Galliano into the right circles as well. Tally also worked his own magic through his connections to Karl Lagerfeld and Yves Saint Laurent's inner circles. Tally took their couture clients to the side and asked for their help in partially funding that collection. Dodie Rosencrans, a San Franciscan YSL client, Princess Lucy Young Hamilton, an heiress to the Jif peanut butter fortune, and most significant to this story, Sao Slumberger, all contributed funds to put on the spring 1994 collection, and all attended it as well. And the collection was a smashing success, and got the fashion crowd to incessantly chatter about Galliano, which is usually a good thing. After the success of the collection, Tally was instructed by Wintour to quote, do whatever you need to do to make Galliano happen. Essentially, this meant find Galliano a financial backer, as his current one, Faisal Amour, would no longer produce Galliano's collections as they were nowhere near commercially viable for him. And so American Vogue brought Galliano out to New York, where he dined with the city's elite. He told everyone he met about his dream of having his own haute couture house, and eventually got a contact at the investment firm Payne Weber, which has since been merged with UBS. What that means? I don't know, but it happened. The contact was secured through Caddy Marin, the Payne Weber's chairman's wife, and a contributing Vogue editor. Again, proving how vital Vogue support pushed by Anna Wintour and vouched for by Andre Leon Talley was. Now, while Marin's husband didn't care much for the collection after seeing a video of it, straight men can't live with them, can live without them. I Josh, I Josh. His wife passed it along to John Bolt of Payne Weber International and Mark Rice, his business partner, who were both intrigued. Again, Tally was the point of contact for Galliano and went with him to the meeting with the duo to vouch on his behalf and demonstrate that Anna Wintour's Vogue was willing to back the young designer as well. Now, since Payne Weber International was looking to invest, the duo asked how much Galliano would need, to which he replied that he didn't actually know. Tally spoke up saying, we can take whatever you can give us. How about $50,000? Now, the duo double-checked with Galliano, asking if that would be sufficient, and his then-assistant Stephen Robinson confirmed that fabric could be bought and samples could be produced, and without hesitation, the duo gave them the funds. Must be nice. I wish I could say, I want $50,000. And somebody would say, sure. And I'd say, 
gray. Now, without Tally, none of this deal would have been possible as we've discussed. The meeting itself would have literally never happened, but Tally, as a representative of Vogue, secured a solid amount of funds for the young designer. Without this money, which Tally never took a finder's fee for, couldn't be me. Galliano would have more than likely fallen into obscurity as he wouldn't have been able to continue designing. And I understand the hesitation to applaud Tally for bringing Galliano to prominence as his anti-Semitic comments were and still are vile, but Tally wouldn't have known about the prejudice or addiction problems when he was negotiating this deal. And some of you may even say, Luke, why did you choose a topic like this out of all of the legacies Andre put in place? Few fashion editors of any race had the ability to pull financial, societal, and fashionable strings the way that Tally did. And to not do on ALT's creation of a seminal fashion show that influenced the appointments at some of the most iconic fashion houses in the world would be a crime in my opinion. Without this collection, Galliano wouldn't have been appointed at Givenchy, which paved the way for Bernard Arnault to appoint him at Dior. British designers were not seen as worthy of such an honor, and there had been a furious uproar when the Italian Gianfranco Ferre had been appointed at Christian Dior as well. But in the 1970s and 1980s, the Italians like Valentino, Versace, Prada, Armani had given a reason for the country to be noted as somewhere to look. But the British designers were not seen as that important. London wasn't a must-stop in terms of the Fashion Week schedule either. And in a way, that all changed with this Lumberger collection, which made Galliano a hit, and without him being a hit, Alexander McQueen's appointment at Givenchy would have been far less likely. There's a lot tied into here, and nobody wants to imagine that experience, so thank God. And to continue, you might not have had Stella McCartney at Chloe, which means no Phoebe Philo at Chloe, and then of course no Phoebe Philo at Celine, no Jonathan Anderson at Loewe, no Kim Jones at Louis Vuitton or Dior, and no Claire White, Keller, Oswald, Boateng, and Julian McDonald at Givenchy either. Now maybe some of those names are inconsequential for people, but it doesn't negate the fact that for some time starting around the early 1990s with Galliano's appointment at Givenchy, the French-owned fashion brands and conglomerates took a liking to British designers. And will I go as far as to say this is completely thanks to Andre Leon Talley? No. But did he no doubt push the first domino? I would think it's fair to say so. Now, after Talley had secured the funds for Galliano, the designer and his ramshackle team began to work on the fall 1994 collection. Finally, we've arrived at the main event. Well, we've arrived at the fact that they had the money for the main event. Talley knew that the budget was tight. Even with a five-figure check and continuing to use his own personal and professional resources on behalf of Galliano, there's a lot of work to do. He brought Galliano all around Paris trying to find a venue for the show to take place. And then he had a brilliant idea. Sao Slumberger, the Portuguese socialite widow to the exorbitantly wealthy French oil magnate Pierre Slumberger, had a home called L'Hôtel de Lusie at 6 Rue Ferro that sat empty. I apologize again to the entire country of France and the French language, sorry. For reference, a hotel in French doesn't always mean a hotel in English. It can refer to a grand and big estate like the Slimbergers. Now, Sao stubbornly refused to sell the home full of small and medium-sized salons for anything less than what she thought it was worth. She had turned down an offer for 20 million, and that was in the early 1990s. The Slimbergers were that kind of rich, and 20 million was way too poor. Now, while I can't find exactly how Tally became well acquainted with Slimberger, I can imagine it was through her love of the arts and hosting some of the most extravagant parties that Paris had seen during the 20th century. Sal Slimberger, background, commence. She was a lover of art. She had bought Matisse's and Monet's on behalf of her husband Pierre in the 1960s, and as well as becoming an ardent supporter of contemporary artists of the time like Mark Rothko, Jealous, and Roy Lichtenstein. Now, when Andy Warhol was rising to prominence, she took him under her wing when he came to Paris, and she was one of the earliest patrons of his silkscreen technique, and I deduce that this was how she became acquainted with Andre Leon Talley to some degree. Talley worked as a receptionist and then editor of Warhol's magazine interview, now led by Rihanna's former stylist Mel Ottenberg. Andy more than likely was a bridge or common interest for Tally and Slimberger, and their relationship continued on as Tally gained more prominence on the front rows of haute couture brands like Yves Saint Laurent and Chanel. Tally mentions that he would often attend Slumberger's couture fittings and Christian Lacroix as well, and she had been a client of Hubert de Givenchy, Christian Dior, and Madame Grey, to name just a few more. 
Tally invited her to lunch and asked if she would mind if Galliano could use the home. And being not only a friend of Andre, but also, again, a fervent supporter of the arts, she easily agreed. Andre even mentions in his book, The Chiffon Trenches, that Sow said to him after agreeing, I'll go get a little facelift in preparation as well. Evidently, she was more than happy to oblige and get a little nip-tuck as she did it. Whether Sao Slumberger actually knew who Galliano was is unclear, as there are varying accounts. Dana Thomas, author of Gods and Kings, mentions that Sao had helped fund the spring 1994 collection, but Tally says in Chiffon Trenches that she didn't know who he was when he agreed to give him the space. But regardless, Slumberger's belief in Galliano's talent, described by her as, quote, fantasy, but extremely well cut, allowed the designer a space worthy of such work. For Tally, the work was far from over, as Galliano had issues with his clothing production. He had been working with the manufacturer Fécal Amour, a Paris-based businessman who ran the company Plein Sud, a ready-to-wear brand. Now, Amour had underwritten Galliano's spring 1992 collection, while he also helped Galliano find a long-term financial backer and also, like, paid for his apartment. So Amour was doing sugar daddy workloads. But the issue was, while Galliano did sell clothes, the returns for Amour were sparse and deliveries of the clothing weren't being made on time, which only further hurt profits. But even though Galliano's spring 1994 collection was a critical success, Amour did not want to continue supporting Galliano and told Andre Leontelli that Galliano was, quote, bankrupting him and that, also, quote, he was out. Amour said, I'm done. It's over. Tally convinced Anna Wintour to write to Amour asking if he would not stop Galliano from showing another collection after how popular the last one had been. And Amour, very kindly, acquiesced. Again, without Tally writing for Galliano, the collection would have never even happened. But still, Tally now had a show venue and had gotten Galliano to start working on the actual looks, but what about everything else? Models, hair, makeup, shoes, jewelry. Well, Tally had that covered as well. Between his own personal relationship and the business relationship with Vogue, Manolo Blahnik, the famed shoemaker, donated footwear for the occasion. And the brilliant Amanda Harlick wrangled the jewels from a few different jewelry houses, but never told the brands that she would involve the others. So Galliano would mix necklaces, earrings, and brooches from Harry Winston, Fred Joalier, Cartier, Rene Boivin, and Van Cleef and Arpels, which was incredibly déclassé as far as the jewelry houses felt, but it worked. Hair and makeup also agreed to do the show for free, with Julian Deese slicking back the model's hair and creating sculptural headpieces, while the supermodels of the world, like Kate Moss, Naomi Campbell, Linda Evangelista, Chrissy Turlington, Nadja Auerman, Helena Christensen, Carla Bruni, and Shalom Harlow, who all commanded top dollar prices for their presence on the catwalk, agreed to walk the show for free because they understood Galliano's talent. But I'm sure also doing a favor for Andre Leon Talley, Anna Wintour, and Vogue didn't hurt. I'll walk for free, you give me a cover, life is good, right? And so on the morning of March 5th, 1994, John Galliano presented his collection. And everybody was there. From the socialites like Slumberger, Beatrice de Ross Shield, as well as designers like John Franco Ferre and Christian Louboutin, to press like Women's Wear Daily, The New York Times, and of course Vogue, they all waited in anticipation while Galliano scampered around trying to finish last minute touches or sew models like Kate Moss and Naomi Campbell into their ensembles. And then it began. The collection began with a rather short style, clad in black stockings and strappy Manolos. Carla Bruni strutted into the rooms of the estate wearing only a shawl and black satin backed crepe. The fabric was synthetic, as even on a budget of 50000 Galliano could only afford synthetics. The piece spoke to the bias cut used for the creation of a full garment, which was developed by Madeleine Viennet. Now, the bias cut is a technique where fabric is cut diagonally, rather than on the warp or the weft which allows a more fluid drape and a clingier composition. Now, the off-the-shoulder shawl was matte, emphasizing the fact that Galliano would use both the crepe and satin sides of the fabric to feign the fact that he had more fabric choices than he actually did. Now, when people say fashion is all smoke and mirrors, this is a good example because it's true. We're all liars. We lie. All the time. Now, Bruni is also doused in tulle, which Galliano said gave a, quote, late 1940s feel. Something you will see quite a lot throughout the collection is cheek. Now, not only on the faces of the models, but also on their butts. 
The shawl just barely skims the equator of Bruni's bottom and is cheeky, no pun intended, in a way that is reminiscent of an image by the surrealist artist Man Ray of the singer and model Kiki de Montparnese. Kiki de Montparnese was mentioned as another inspiration for the collection by Galliano, seeing as how the Galliano woman was being engulfed by the glitz, the glam, and the gluttony of the 1920s in Paris, and seeing as how Kiki was referred to as the Queen of Montparnasse, a Parisian neighborhood, it all ties together. The image by Man Ray where Kiki's nude body is seen as a cello and exposes the top half of her bottom inverts the proportions of Galliano's first look for this collection, where Kiki's buttocks and legs are probably covered by fabric, Bruni is left almost bare from that halfway point down. This collection is rife with 1920s references, and this theorized nod to Kiki is one of the subtler moments, but she's a character Galliano would go on to reference throughout his years of Dior as well. The look that followed consisted of a black leather coat slung over the model's shoulders, while a black handkerchief slip dress flowed seamlessly underneath. The leather was so shiny that I initially thought it was the satin side of the fabric, and Dana Thomas wrote that the collar was trimmed in mink as well. So my thing is like, where were we getting the mink? I did the research, I can't find it. Where was the mink coming from? Now a pert Naomi Campbell followed, and she, like the other models, was doing the show for free, but had a deeper history with Galliano, as the first show she ever walked was back in the 1980s. She wore a black shearling shawl for this current collection, which again fell to only the hip bone, while she wore a black satin short instead of just underwear and stockings. While the look isn't exactly something to write home about, it only inflated the air of glamour that would come to be associated with Galliano after the collection. I mean, a woman with a fur wrapped around her that is falling off of her shoulders and barely there. It feels a little bit coquettish, and not coquettish, coquettish. And in the context of the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s European fashion and cultural references, even more so. Nausea Auerman followed in an almost exact replica of the look, but instead of a sculptural headpiece by Julian Deese, she donned a cloche hat by Stephen Jones. Now, Galliano spoke incessantly about the influence of the 1940s on this collection, but so far, it's rather minimal in comparison to the influx of the 1920s garment. The cloche hat, more than likely in wool, had a large Harry Winston brooch and mirrored faux flowers and floral motifs that could have been attached to the hats at that time. Cloche hats, or bell hats if we translate it, were commonplace in the 1920s and were created by Carolyn Ribot. Now, Galliano's addiction of the cloche here helps to further ingrain the viewer into the 1920s craze that surrounds his clothing and Kiki. Now, Lucy de la Follet, who is the niece of the Yves Saint Laurent muse and designer Lulu de la Follet, strolled out after wearing a black satin teddy, which only bolsters the array of boudoir clothes that have already been shown. Now, for those that don't know, a teddy is a type of lingerie that works almost like a bodysuit and began to become popular in the 1910s, but by the 1920s, they would be worn under the loose-fitting and free-moving clothing of that period, only further infusing that roaring aesthetic to the collection. And to top it all off, lingerie is not inherently sexy, as Cora Harrington, an expert in the field, would be the first to let that be known. But this idea of wearing traditional lingerie as everyday wear would become rather popular throughout the 1990s as well. I mean, Versace had already shown his Miss s and collection by this point, and even models from this very show, <coughs> Kate Moss, <coughs> Naomi Campbell, had proven negligees and slip dresses were back in vogue, and they didn't have to be back in vogue in your bedroom. Lucy's teddy consisted of spaghetti straps with jeweled baubles, which could have been from the high-end jewelry houses like Harry Winston, Fred, or Renee, or Van, or Cleef or arc bolts, but they sit on both straps. And the actual bodice was opaque all throughout the front, but from serratus anterior, or the area below the armpit, there is a sheer section that flows all the way to the back, creating a V-shape till it meets the opaque satin again. Now, in keeping with previous Galliano collections that enjoyed referencing 18th century court dress, I wonder if this V-shaped sheer panel is a reference to the en ferro, or design technique where a bodice and skirt were joined through a continuous piece of fabric that actually kept the area smooth to maintain said V-shape. I'm unsure, but it's my guess. 
Now added to the look was an organza scarf that fell almost to the floor on both the front and back of the teddy to create drama as well as a little purse that had an art deco feel. She wore a blue sculpted headpiece as well as a mini beret in black with a stiff and dramatized cabillaud, which is the actual name for that stem spike thing on top of a beret, the more you know. And when the seamed stockings and heels are added in, it just creates a gorgeous boudoir non-boudoir effect. The look that followed was a signature Galliano creation that spoke again to his fascination with Viennese bias cut, as well as the romanticism of Spanish dress. Galliano was born in Gibraltar, pronounced Gibraltar in English, or Gibraltar in Spanish, which is at the southern tip of Spain and sits on the Strait of Gibraltar, which is a tiny waterway that grants the Atlantic Ocean access to the Mediterranean. Now, Gibraltar is a British overseas territory and has been since the British captured it during the Spanish War in 1713, the more you know. Now, Galeano's mother was Spanish and from La Linea de la Concepcion, the Spanish border town across from Gibraltar, whose southern Spanish roots included flamenca. Now, flamenco was a music style commonly played on the guitar that can be danced to as well, and is believed to have been brought to Spain somewhere in the 9th to 14th centuries by the Andalusian Roma people. The hub of flamenco would become Seville, which is a little north of Gibraltar and La Linea de la Concepcion, and in 1847, during the city's April cattle trading fair, flamenco dress with ruffles and flounces, polka dots, and rich colors became the unofficial uniform of the event. While most flamenco wearers during that time were of the lower classes, aristocratic women were intrigued by their clothes and began to adopt the styles as well, and in 1929, flamenco became the, quote, official dress of the April Fair. Now, Galliano's dress captures a flamenco feeling through the flounce that runs along the neckline and off the left shoulder, which correlates back to the peasant and Andalusian Roma dress of southern Spain and its ability to modernize and adapt to changing cultural and societal dress. Now the right side of the dress has a black cluster of organza that creates a faux corsage and is more clearly visible as it runs down the shoulder blade, and could be a reference to the flowers worn in the hair of flamenco dancers. But as to the rest of the dress, it differs quite heavily from the traditional flamenco style, which usually have large skirts made of tears and ruffles, rather than a bias cut slip dress utilizing the technical manipulations of Madeleine Viennet's work for reference. And this is where we see Galliano meld things together. 1920s Paris mixed with his own Spanish culture and heritage, it happens. Galliano had been using the bias cut since his spring 1989 collection and mixing the technique that clings to the body with flamenco details depicts the style in a new light that can be about movement just in a different form. Its construction is also rather intriguing because we can see that Galliano utilized the bias cut technique to contour the body, specifically the waist and the swallowtail bias cut notches that sit right at the bottom of the thighs, not only allow the dress to actually fall in the typical flounce manner at the hem, but highlights the derriere by fitting to it, giving the dress a much more seductive effect than a typical bias cut style. Now, Galliano was also quoted as saying, after you wear it for about half an hour, your body temperature breaks down the fibers of the fabric, and that would mold itself even further into the body. Now, the following look was another bias cut dress, this time with a handkerchief skirt in that classic black. But what makes it stand out is the strange neck sweater situation that sits on top of it. It's a white fur shrug of sorts whose neckline is wide yet slightly risen. It is more than likely a white chinchilla fur, which is one of the most expensive furs because of its density and the size of the pelts being so small. The shrug is held together by one large black button that creates a fall away effect as the shrug moves down the body. And I wonder if this garment is not another reference to Kiki de Montparnasse. The muse was often photographed wearing furs with some being white and others being in shrug form, like the one shown here where she stands with the Japanese photographer Iwata Nakayama. And the shrug from the back is also rather intriguing due to the way that it exaggerates the latimus dorsi, or the area right below the shoulder blade. Look at me getting on Grey's Anatomy. And the fact that it folds in not on itself make it look even larger, but at the same time raises the neckline via the vertical pelts so high that it elongates the back of the neck too, making it a strange but very intriguing garment. And we should also discuss the hair pieces designed by none other than Julian Deese. Yes, those blue and red plastic sculptures that sit on the model's heads were a spur of the moment creation and really add such a fun energy to the collection. According to another magazine, Jennifer Osterhout, who was an assistant to Galliano, recounts the story. He arrived so late with all of his Japanese assistants dressed in black. As soon as he got there, he was leaving, and everyone was freaking out. 
The show was supposed to be starting in about 20 minutes. He and his assistants all went to the stationary section of BHV, a chain of Parisian department stores, and bought all of these bright blue, green, red, and yellow plastic sheets. They came back and started cutting them into strips, and then he begins rolling them up and takes a match to make a small hole. Then he slides in a hairpin and begins linking them all together to make these sculptures in the hair. And the end results were show-stopping pieces that drew your eye to the model's head, which honestly are fantastic and really add so much to it. Next we see a black silk suit saunter through the rooms with its double-breasted construction and wide leg pants. The suit was meant to play on the history of 1940s smoking jackets and it did so pretty well. Firstly, smoking suits are now often attributed to none other than Yves Saint Laurent, but at the time his Le Smoking Suit from the 1970s took direct inspiration from the 1940s. The smoking suit is often attributed to menswear starting in the 1600s as a uniform for smoking after a dinner, but as the centuries progressed, it changed alongside popular fashions, and by the 1850s, they began to take inspiration from Turkish dress due to an influx in Turkish tobacco being used around Europe, and specifically Great Britain. Now, this Turkish influence would line up with another critical aesthetic that John Galliano often referenced, which was Orientalism. We will discuss it further when we reach the Japanese and kimono parts of the collection, but Turkey along with most of the East was considered the Orient by the West and found it and its culture exotic. Yeah, I hate saying these words as much as you hate hearing them, but giving you the context. Turkey along with the Middle East and Asia were all lumped together as these foreign lands whose culture could be molded and played with. Now Paul Poiret, the first great fashion designer, utilized Orientalism in his clothing and it's what set him apart. He also is another great designer that Galliano found riveting and studied, resulting in what is undoubtedly a major force in this collection. To top this all off, the smoking suits were usually made of silk and went over top of the wearer's clothes as it would actually protect the clothing underneath and smoke and ash. And by the 1940s, we can see that there are double-breasted versions as well. But getting into the 1940s fashion in general, we can also see that the suit becomes a clothing item that women can wear. The most famous is, of course, Marlena Dietrich. And women begin to feel more comfortable wearing it out and about. Now, I won't say that Dietrich is an inspiration for the suit, but it does seem appropriate that women's suiting would have become a little bit more popular during this time. The suit itself is rather breathtaking as the sleeve seen on Chrissy Turlington in Vogue's September 1994 issue showcases their length and the subtle bell sleeve that only accentuates the arms. The body of the jacket is also flared, and we can see this as we move towards the bottom of it. And the pant has a nice flare shape to it as well, culminating in a constant elongation. The satin back crepe also has such a fluidity to it, yet remains structured as the model strikes a pose, and it's really a feat of tailoring that diverts from the usual stiff and stuffy suiting practices. Now excuse my French, but it's a f***ing look. And it's for sale if you want to buy it for me. It's just a little over 8k. If you do buy it for me, I will love you forever. Another double-breasted smoking jacket follows, but boy, is it different. In reality, the jacket is completely sheer, and that's due to it being made out of black organza. Now, you can see that the double-breasted panel that runs down the center is there, which then falls to the top of the thigh and is paired only with another sheer black garter stocking. The look is sexy, seductive, and plays on a new type of tailoring that seems more boudoir than business. Although if someone showed up in that to a business meeting I was at, I would be complaining. But while the sheer style is certainly intriguing, the yellow shantung silk band that wraps around the model's bust and waist is what draws your eye more so. And this is where we begin to talk more about the Orientalism that inspired Galliano, as he draws inspiration from Japanese dress, specifically here, the obi. Now, many know what a kimono looks like, but you may not know about the belt that actually holds the kimono together. It has a very fascinating history that we'll discuss. Now, kimonos, and with them obis, have been around for centuries, and specifically have been traced back to at least the Nara period in Japan in the early 700s, starting as ropes to uphold the kusoda, which was the predecessor to the modern kimono. During the Nara period, the rope began to become a piece of fabric resembling a belt, and by the 
Muromachi period from 1333 to 1573, the obi belt became less exclusively a functional garment and developed ornamental properties as well. Now, by the mid-1700s, the obi had widened considerably and took up most of the wearer's torso. And fast forward to the Edo period in the 1800s, the legendary kabuki performer Kamimura Koyachi's style of obi tying on the stage only further advanced the techniques and the bow styles that could be found throughout Japan. So we can see that Galliano's obi reference seems to be a little more modern than the original obi styles from the Nara period, as it's far more ornamental in a bright yellow with that silver floral embroidery running horizontally along it. And there are many ways to tie the obi knot or the masubi, if you didn't know, I did not, now we do, and that can depend on the occasion that you're attending. And this looks could be a traditional tie or could be a Galliano take on a traditional obi knot. Unfortunately, I can't differentiate Masubi expertly, so I don't want to give any false information on it. I tried, I really googled a lot, and I couldn't find anything, so I apologize. Now, was it really right for Galliano to reference the obi and Masubi at all, let alone adapt it in a non-traditional way? Well, that's something else we have to discuss as part of Orientalism is the exotification of a culture without at all trying to understand said culture. And that's something that happened quite often with Japan as it opened its doors to the West during the Edo period starting in 1853. This specific Western sort of fetish with Japanese culture and its products is called Japanese Mei, and oftentimes the stereotypes that the West began to make about Japanese culture and specifically the kimono and the obi are incredibly harmful. When Japan opened itself up to the West, the early visitors, mostly white men of European descent, saw Japanese women wearing kimonos and dismissed them as merely wearing, quote, nightgowns. And this stereotype of the kimono persisted. Author Terry Satsuki Milhaput highlights how harmful the stereotype of the kimono can be in her book Kimono. She shows an example of how the French artist James Tussaud depicted a woman wearing a kimono with nothing underneath it in his painting Le Japanese au bain, but in reality, it is inherently sexual for no reason. The painting associates the kimono with nudity and bearing oneself, which isn't true of the kimono and its wearers, and is a great example of the stereotyping that went on in Japanese mei. The kimono has traditionally always had an undergarment that is worn underneath it. Depicting it with nothing underneath makes it much more sexualized than it actually is and only further enhances this exotic and sexual nature of Japanese women that would come to play in the decades after Japan opened its doors to the West. Now, what does this all have to do with Galliano's looks? Well, the looks here are sheer and have an obi that covers the breasts as it sits on the torso and could be seen as a similar endeavor to Tissot's painting in the context of depicting the obi as a boudoir object. Galliano continues to reference the obi and the kimono and other looks which we should also discuss. Galliano made a sister style for this organza look, but it was in a bright pink organza, this time with a black obi with a rose embroidery wrapped around the wafy Kate Moss's torso. The pink version of the style still incorporates Japanese mei aesthetics through the sheer elements and the use of the obi as a corset or bandeau top, but it also exposes another intriguing detail about the sheer dress. We can see in this much lighter color the details of the creases and pockets which showcase the tailoring abilities of Galliano's British fashion education. But the back of the garment, particularly over the shoulder blades, is rather intriguing to explore as well. The pink organza seems to have been overlaid with yellow organza too, and looks to have been tied in a large knot almost like an obi could be. Obviously, this knot is far different than the traditional masubi, but there seems to be a nod through this technique to the Japanese tradition of dressing. I'm not saying it's a good nod to the tradition, but I just think we should note that it probably is one. The following look was another Japanese may reference in the form of a black satin-backed crepe dress with enlarged sleeves and another yellow obi tied across the waist. But this dress was actually opaque. But the issue is once again, the dress does in its silky satin sheen feel like a boudoir fantasy rather than a realistic recreation of a kimono. And with the model letting the collar of her dress slink off her shoulder every so often as she walked around corners of a stately home, it's hard again not to see the desire from Galliano to add a sex appeal to the garment. 
Now, if we look at the way this dress in particular is constructed, it does have a double-breasted crossover feature in the front and shiny bell sleeves, which feels more European. The neckline is no different than the kimono, though, and is in the style of the juban collar, which was the Japanese version of a chemise or undergarment that actually protected the fine garment aka the kimono in a beautiful fabric with gorgeous embroidery from the sweat and oils of the body. Weird, it's almost like Eastern culture and Western culture aren't that different in terms of garment construction, but okay. Daliano specifically wanted to recognize that, quote, the nape of the neck being the more erotic part of a geisha girl's body was important, which also might be why he decided to mix the neckline of the kimono with the tailoring of Europe. The style of wearing the kimono a bit off the shoulder is called the katahada and is meant to help allow both ventilation and a wider range of movement. But again, Western perceptions probably sexualize this function functional styling to make it seem more sexual than it actually was. I'm sure Galliano instructed the model to also entice the audience in this way and play into slipping the dress off the shoulder in a sexy manner, which only further adds to this fetishization of the kimono. The obi on this dress also seems to have been added to as it is no longer just a yellow jacquard, but rather has been embroidered with shiny lilies that stretch across the obi as well. Linda Evangelista also sauntered out in another black dress of the same style, which would later go on to be named the quote mini mono or mini kimono due to the shortening of the traditional kimono to a cocktail length. Galliano said he wanted to keep the purity of the kimono, but also mix it with 1940s jacket styles that the models would wear alone. But something about the purity of the kimono is lost here in my opinion, especially when you shorten it so much. Now Evangelista's obi was black with the same floral motif as the others, but the beautiful embroidery fell into the matching black dress underneath, and the obi almost disappeared from view. And now that we've waded through all of the Orientalism and Japanese may looks, I think it's clear to see that Galliano played into the exotification of Japanese culture and its garments. Now, some may be quick to label this remix of kimonos and obis, quote, cultural appropriation, which I think many sensible people could say. Now, instead of painstakingly recreating the traditional kimono garments, they have sexualized and shortened and turned into nothing more than sexy nightgowns. Feels a little bit cultural appropriation-y. To me. And while that is all true, Japan as a country as early as 1879 began to engage in westernizing kimonos in order to appeal to western audiences and expand their trading capabilities. Art from 1879 showcases that the kimono was printed with the American flag in celebration of President Ulysses S. Grant's visit to the country, and the Japanese department store Takashimaya began to create a souvenir line that was specifically designed with western wearers in mind by 1876. Japan's government even began to work with marketers and manufacturers within the country in order to prosper off of the Japanese-made trend when it came to clothing and textiles. I bring this up because it shows that Japan has no problem playing on stereotypes of Japanese dress in order to make a buck, but that doesn't mean that John Galliano, who has no ties to the country, really should be allowed to do that as well. Listen, I'm allowed to make as many gay jokes as I like because it sells me to straight people, but I don't want to hear any gay jokes from the straight people. It's not for you, it's for me. Do you see what I'm saying? Now listen, there more than likely won't be a conclusive answer on whether or not these clothes are in fact culturally appropriative, but I would say they certainly lean more into that category because of the fetishization and the stereotyping of the garments then they do lean away from that. Now the finale look tied together the colors, the Japanese may, and the 1940s to create a bubblegum pink fitted gown. The spaghetti straps that uphold this clingy dress lead into a Japanese inspired embroidery that we have already seen, except it doesn't sit on an obi wrapped around the torso, but rather has just been applied to the actual dress's bodice, which also languidly hangs and touches the waist. The dress then becomes skin tight, prying at every curve on Christy Turlington's body, while a masubi sits right above the bum, but because of the tight but technical fit, it doesn't actually take away from it, which I think is rather nice. The skirt then veers off into a dramatic mermaid silhouette and is wrapped with a layer of yellow organza that hangs over the front of the pink and wraps around the back in a restrained manner. This effect is rather reminiscent of an apron overskirt from the Victorian period and the gathering of the fabric in the back feels like a drag down bustle as well, which only further adds to the long list of references in the collection and showcases that even this early on in Galliano's career mixing and matching different techniques from different periods and cultures was a thing he was going to do. The dress was topped off with another shearling fur coat slung around Turlington, which only added to the grandeur. And that is the end of the collection, but while it was the end of the show, it was far from the end of Galliano's career. 
The collection was incredibly well received as harsh critics like Kathy Horn showered praise upon it saying, quote, Galliano managed to convey a wicked sense of elegance. It was brilliant. I mean, Anna Wintour in her 73 Questions for Vogue even mentioned that it was her favorite collection. It just, it was a career defining moment for John. And retailers including Bergdorf Goodman, Neiman Marcus, Harrods, Gallery Lafayette, and Saks Fifth Avenue all arrived at Slimberger's home the next day in order to see the collection up close and personal and place orders, which is most important. Between the reception and the sales, two potential financial backers, John Bolt and Mark Rice, decided to fully invest in Galliano and John Galliano the brand as well. Tally's plan had worked, which won him favor not only with Galliano, but also with Anna Wintour, as he proved that once again he could be a political fashion wheeler and dealer who could strike successful arrangements and spot talent that could deliver. This collection truly put Galliano on the map from a press perspective, as he would go on to be a hot topic in the fashion world through discussions and interviews and a whole lot of photo shoots, and even a candidate in the world of LVMH. Now, Richard Simonon, an LVMH executive, was given the task of finding a replacement for Hubert de Givenchy, who would show his last collection on July 11th, 1994, from none other than Bernard Arnault himself, because LVMH at that time had owned Givenchy, and still does, but they had done it as well. And while there was pushback from other executives about his substance abuse issues and behavior, Simonon continued to push for Galliano to become the brand's new creative director. Arnaud eventually met Galliano and pressed him on whether or not he could actually design with the Givenchy house codes in mind, and if he could actually keep a younger customer's interest, which Galliano would go on to assure him he could. And after some more deliberations, Arnaud agreed to hire him. The announcement was made only a few hours after Givenchy had shown his last collection for the couture season on July 12, 1995. And a little over a year later, John Galliano would be named creative director of Christian Dior on October 14, 1996. It's rather undeniable that Galliano's fall 1994 collection led the way to these opportunities. And without the help and referrals of none other than Andre Leon Talley, it would have never happened. John Galliano probably would have went back to, I don't know, teaching. That's, that's it. John Galliano might have been lost to history if Andre Leon Talley had not stepped up and gotten his hands dirty. And that is the story of how Andre Leon Talley saved John Galliano's career. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really love getting to do these videos. I'm sorry I hadn't done one in a hot minute. They just take a long time, but I'm feeling the vibes again. So I'm gonna keep doing them. Please let me know if there are any other collections you guys really want me to discuss. Please let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to hear it. I will see you guys in the next video and TTYL.